Stayallday.com. Um, I do want to get underway and introduce our dynamic speaker today. We're very pleased to have Dre Baldwin here today. Uh, Dre is a marketing, branding, and internet pioneer who built his name on the same discipline and persistence that made him a professional athlete. Uh, after graduating with a business, marketing, and management degree from Penn State Ultima in 2004, Dre played pro basketball internationally for nine years, snapping, uh, excuse me, spanning eight countries. Uh, coming from a humble athletic background, Dre had no choice but to market and promote himself tirelessly to create his professional opportunities, not to mention working on his game to be ready to deliver when the opportunity was created. Dre started filming and publishing his basketball workouts and motivational messages to YouTube in 2006. In 2009, Dre decided to start a practice of posting a new video daily to his YouTube channel, a discipline that continues to this day. He has published over 4,500 videos to YouTube which grew out to his 100,000 plus subscribers, which is an uh, immense amount of subscribers, and have been viewed over 30 million times. That's incredible. Um, the presence Dre developed through his videos and blogging led to the development of his Dre All Day and Work On Your Game brands. Dre is now a multifaceted entrepreneur who has never been one to do just one thing. Dre works with brand owners, businesses, entrepreneurs, and up-and-coming athletes to enhance their online presence and reach consumers through leveraging emerging tools of branding and marketing. Dre has published five books, over 100 athletic training programs, is a professional speaker, and an internationally known expert on the topics of discipline, marketing, and branding. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the podium, Dre Paul and Dre. Chamber and all the Pulse members for being here today. Let me make sure we're all set up. All right. Now, my friend Michelle is a masseuse. Michelle came to me one day and she said, Dre, I'm having trouble getting my business recognition in the South Florida marketplace. Very saturated, there are a lot of massage therapists out there. How do I separate myself from everybody else? What I did with Michelle was what I call a convention center test. If any of you can do this with whatever, whatever business, whatever industry you're in. I said, Michelle, imagine you're down at the Miami Beach Convention Center. There are a thousand other people in your same industry all in that room, so a thousand massage therapists. Now, up on the stage, there's a potential buyer, potential customer. She wants to get a massage. On top of that, she says, whomever I get this massage from, I'm gonna be a loyal customer for the next 10 years in your business. Only thing is, there are a thousand of you in the room. How do I decide which one of you is the best massage therapist to get a massage from? And I said, Michelle, you have 60 seconds to explain to that buyer and everybody else in the room why your massage business is the one she should patronize. Go. So Michelle says, well, I have many years of experience. I know several different ways of doing massage. I have a bunch of satisfied clients. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> Michelle, I'm falling asleep already. In your industry, in your business, if you're not able to separate yourself, differentiate yourself clearly from the beginning and explain what makes you different, everyone else in your industry who's doing the same thing, you're going to be in the social media rat race. Well, social media today, ladies and gentlemen, the currency of social media is not money. The currency of today is attention. If you have someone's attention, you can sell them something. If no one's paying attention to you, you can't sell them anything. The reason why attention is the number one currency in social media is because everyone's competing for it. And all your potential buyers have a limited attention bank account. All of the terms we hear about when it comes to social media marketing or marketing in general, fans, buyers, likes, ROI, engagement, conversion, none of this happens if you don't have someone's attention. What I'm going to share with you today are some ways to get your piece of that attention of your buyers. Does that make sense? All right. Now, 
just to give you a little bit of background on myself outside of what Paul explained in that beautiful background description. My name is Drake Ball, and I can confirm that. I am from Philadelphia. My background is actually as a professional athlete. I've been in South Florida for about eight plus years. After I finished playing basketball, I was looking to see what, what I was going to do next, and I realized that I'd already put together a marketing and branding platform. And I built my platform on the same formats, the same platforms that we're going to talk about today. YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, my own personal website. So what I do these days is work with brand owners, businesses, and entrepreneurs on getting their marketing messages heard through building brand awareness. Now, number one thing, first thing we're going to talk about when it comes to social media, marketing and branding, is that a lot of people have some misconceptions about certain terms and certain things that we do. So the first thing I need to make clear is what's the difference between branding and marketing? Does everyone understand that there is a difference between the two? Now, first of all, branding means literally to mark something. It actually comes from back on the farms where a farmer, let's say Farmer Jones, puts his brand on the hide of his cow so no one can steal his cattle. When someone sees this cow, they say, oh, that's a Farmer Jones cow. So to brand literally means to make your mark. For example, Coca-Cola is a brand name. Now, on the other hand, you have marketing. Marketing means to promote or sell a product or a service. Your product or service can be a person, it can be a massage, so it can be a car. When you're marketing something, you don't necessarily have to have a brand name and you can still be successful in your marketing. For example, two weeks ago, I bought a bottle of water from this guy on the side of the highway, right at the red light. I have no idea who this guy is. I can't go on Yelp and check in and leave him a positive review. I couldn't pick him out of a police lineup and no one knows his business's name. He probably doesn't have a business name. But his market, the timing, the product, and the placement were all in place at the right times all together, enough for him to make a sale. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. And when you're marketing something, your brand name can be very strong. People can be very aware of that brand name, yet never buy anything from you. So for example, some of us have never played the Trump Doral golf course. We don't live in his condos, and we don't watch the Celebrity Apprentice. But everyone in here knows who Donald Trump is, yes or no. All right. Is there anyone in this room who never, under any circumstances, will eat McDonald's? Only a few of you, that's surprising me, okay. Now, even though you may not eat McDonald's much, when you see those golden arches, we all know exactly who that is and what it represents. That's an example of a brand name that we are all very well aware of, even though we may not buy from that brand. Now, when it comes to having a strong brand and marketing yourself, anyone who has an extremely strong brand, when their marketing is activated, they can make a lot of sales. Now, Donald Trump, for example, doesn't sell t-shirts. But if he wanted to activate his marketing to do so, he could probably sell more t-shirts than everyone in this room put together, would you agree? Now at the same time, when you take a very strong brand name and you have good marketing combined with it, that's when the magic happens. The Jordan brand is one example of the magic happening of a very strong brand name and a great marketing push. Now you could possibly, with your brand, not have the best product that everyone agrees is the best product. It might be kind of frustrating or a big challenge to actually get to your product. Your placement may be hard to find. You might have to stand in line for a few hours or a few days. You don't have to tirelessly promote what you're doing. You don't have to have it in everybody's face all the time. And you definitely don't have to compete on price. You might have the highest price out of everyone. Apple was a good example of that with the iPhone. I think there's some people in this room who can agree that there are cell phones out there that are better priced, easier to get to, and have more capabilities than the iPhone. But none of them sells better than the iPhone. Does that make sense? Now when it comes to marketing yourself, if you don't have a strong brand name, you better have an exceptional product, a competitive price, be easy to find in places, and have tireless promotion. Or all four at the same time, a combination of all four, if you want your product to get sold without a brand name. So what I'm going to talk about today is social media, marketing and branding yourself on social media. Now some of you who are in here today, for whatever reason, your social media boat is not sailing as well as it could be or as you want it to be. Now maybe you want to go into deeper waters with that boat, maybe you just want a bigger boat. 
What I'm going to do today is show you some ways not only to do that, but to establish equity in your brand to the point that your marketing messages are going to get heard because your brand is established in a way that people only know you for the thing that you do. And then, once you've done that, you can get off of the hamster wheel of social media or the rat wheel or the mouse wheel, I don't know what you call it, that hamster wheel. Hamster wheel of social media of competing with other businesses. Now, one thing that I notice when it comes to social media is people get way too bogged down in useless details when it comes to publishing on social media. And I talked to a few of you before I actually came up here today. I'm hearing a lot of the same things. So people say, hey, how many hashtags should I use in my next tweet? What time should I post on Facebook every week? How long should my YouTube videos be? Should my Facebook picture be the tall way or the wide way? Which filter should I use on Instagram? I see a lot of nodding heads and a lot of smiles here. I'm sure a lot of you have had these questions. If you're asking yourself these questions, you are already losing the social media rat race. Now what I'm going to do, and what I do professionally, is help take businesses completely out of the social media rat race. I don't train you how to win the race. I eliminate the race completely so that your brand does what it wants to do, when, where, and how it wants to do it, and you win no matter how you do that. Is that a fair enough offer? Great. What I do is eliminate the competition. So eliminate the competition, the first thing you have to do is establish equity in your brand name. When that's established, you can publish whenever you want. If you want to publish on Facebook at midnight on Friday, your fans are going to be there engaging with you. And one reason is, you are the only place they can get what you offer. If any of your fans or your buyers can get what you offer somewhere else, that's when you're competing in social media, that's when you're running on that treadmill, you're in the rat race. You're competing on social media, you're gonna be in that rat race forever. Because we know when it comes to social media, nobody's going away. If any of you in your businesses or at your job had a conversation within the last 30 to 60 days where the conclusion was, hey, let's just get out of social media because we don't see any potential in that. Does that happen to anybody? Nobody. So if anything, more people are getting into social media and nobody is getting out of it. Does that make sense? So if you're competing in social media, you're on a treadmill that you're going to be running on for the rest of your life or the life of your business, whichever one lasts long. Now, when you have a strong brand name, you're not competing with anyone. You think about some, a company like Coca-Cola. Who is Coca-Cola competing against? They're not actually competing against anyone. Yes, there are other soda brands. There are other colas out there. But those brands are competing against Coke. Coke is not competing against them. If the Kardashians decided to delete their social media accounts today, who's replacing them? Nobody. There is no competition when you have your own brand name and you establish what it is that you represent. So the question is, who are you? If you don't know the answer to that question, you don't have a brand name. So what I'm going to talk about today is how you establish that brand name and make it clear to all your potential buyers what it is that you do what you deliver, how they can get it from you, and why you are the person to get it from. Now, there are four specific things you need to do to establish a brand name as far as marketing yourself, and you can tie all this into social media. I'm gonna go over all four. The first one is what do you do that no one else does? Number two is your fans need something to identify with. Number three is you have to deliver on your promise, and number four is you sell to your buyers. Now, I'm gonna go over all four. Number one is what do you do that no one else does? The very important thing that you all have to understand is doing something that no one else does doesn't mean you have to do one thing specifically. It can be an intersection of two, three, four, five, or ten things that you do that no one else can say they do. For example, how many social media platforms allow you to publish something publicly immediately? How many do we have? Four, five, ten, twenty, a hundred? Now, on all those social media platforms, how many of them limit you to 140 characters per post? One. One, Twitter. That's their brand name. Their brand is that you can publish something publicly, but you only get 140 characters per post. There is no other business that does exactly that. So they own that space. Does that make sense? Get a lot of blank books. All right, great. Number two is, <clears throat> number two, is that people have to have something to identify with when it comes to your brand. And that can be a logo, like the Golden Arts of McDonald's. It can be a slogan, like Just Do It by Nike. It can be a style. 
Any of you remember in the early 90s there was a rap group called Criss Cross? We had a song called Jump. All right, so y'all, I was wondering when I would put this together if anybody would know what I was talking about. But go ahead. Now, all right, they wore their clothes backwards, right? So in their videos, they were on a magazine cover, if they did an appearance, they had their clothes on backwards. And this was so popular that clothing brands started designing clothes that were made to be worn backwards just because Chris Cross was that popular. Even I was doing it, I'll admit. Anybody else? Just me? Okay, you perfect. <laughs> There's the thing. It might sound silly now, it's funny, but if you were walking around the mall back then and you saw a kid wearing their clothes backwards, you knew exactly what that was for because they were a fan of Chris Cross. There was nothing else to confuse that with. That's the brand. Number three, you have to deliver on your promise. Now, is there anyone in here who's a patron of Starbucks? I'd be. Now, all of you with your hands up, have you been to more than one Starbucks location? Do the drinks taste exactly the same? That's the consistency. People have to know what they're going to get from your brand, how they're going to get it, and when they're going to get it. You have to be able to deliver consistently with your brand name so that people have something to grasp onto. For example, if Maggiano started selling sneakers, let's say they got the best product of sneaker. It was the best material made by the best craftsman in the world. Would you want to buy that shoe? Probably not, because you're like, Maggiano's is a food place, why are they selling sneakers? If Jordan brand hired all the chefs from Maggiano's to start selling food, would you buy food from the Jordan brand? Probably not, because you know them from making scenes. So you have to be consistent with what it is that you deliver so people know what they're going to get from you. There is one exception. That's if your brand happens to be being random, being inconsistent. For example, let's say Mike Tyson. Remember when Mike Tyson went through a period of inconsistency and didn't know what to expect of him? Tattoo on his face, fighting a news reporter. Think about Donald Trump. He started his presidential campaign. He went through about a two-week span. We didn't know what was the next thing that was going to come out of his mouth. And during that period, Donald Trump read every news story. He was on the front page of every website, every newspaper, every blog, true or not true. But the thing with being inconsistent is that you had to keep coming up with more and more radical, ridiculous things to do to keep people's attention. Eventually, people get tired of it. And there's always going to be somebody who's more ridiculous than you are. So in the long run, be consistent. <laughs> Number four is sell to your buyers. And when I say sell to your buyers, I'm not talking about exchanging a product or a service for money. Because remember what I said, social media today is not about money, it's about attention. Currency is attention. So this is about knowing who your audience is and ignoring everyone else. For example, is there anyone in this room who under no circumstances you just don't drink soda? Anyone here who doesn't drink soda at all? All right, now if you have your hand up, Coca-Cola and Sprite, they don't give a damn about your opinion of their product. <laughs> the reason why is because you're not a buyer. They don't care about what you think because you're not buying into what they're doing. Any of you recently been on an airplane, think of this. When the flight attendant comes around with water, what do they say? Would you like some water? No. Would you like some water? No. Would you like some water? Say yes. Yes. <laughs> if she wants some water, I'm putting all my attention on her. These two people, as uh, Kevin O'Leary on Shark Tank says, you're dead to me. I'm not paying any attention to these people. I'm paying all my attention to the buyer. And when I say a buyer, a buyer doesn't mean someone's spending money. A buyer is a person who tries out your product or service on your 30-day trial, subscribes to your emails, follows you on Twitter, likes you on Facebook, follow you on Instagram, and heart all your pictures, giving you hearts on Periscope. A buyer is a person who's engaging with your brand. You don't pay any attention to the people who are not engaging with your brand. So you may be wondering, what if I only have one fan? How do I get the second fan? You put all your attention on that first fan, and when people see what is happening with that first fan, they're going to come in. That fan is going to talk about what they're doing, what they bought. They will bring more people in. You put all your attention on those buyers, and that's how you get more buyers to come in. Does that make sense? Now, there are a few questions that people ask me when it comes to social media. The first one is, if I started doing social media or I'm already doing social media, Dre, what is it that I can talk about? I don't know what to talk about, I don't know how to talk about it, I don't know how to share it. So I'll give you an example. My client, Todd, he's a managing partner at Stavinsky & Funk Law Firm in Miami. That is not Todd. 
Now Todd came to me, he wanted to get some marketing done for his company. I sat down with Todd and I just started asking him a series of questions. Todd, how long have you been in business? What is it that your firm does? What areas of law do you practice? What happens when someone fills out the free consultation form on your site or calls the 1-800 number? He just answered all my questions. We ended up with 70 plus videos to go on his YouTube channel and on his website. So the answer to the what do I talk about question is very simple. You answer the five W's. Who, what, when, where, why, and how of your business. And each one of those topics you can drill down. So if I was to ask you, who are you? That takes more than 140 characters to answer, yes or no. If I was to say what it is that you do, it would take you more than 20 minutes to tell me everything if you wanted to tell me all about your business. If I said, why do you do the business that you do? It's a little bit more than the 250 or so characters you get on Instagram, yes or no. Every topic you can drill down. So who are you? Who are you? You can be if there's more than one person in your company, and each one of them needs to tell people who they are. If your business is the brand, then your business needs to explain who it is. Why are you in business? What got you in business? Where do you practice business? When are you the person to call on for business? So if you answer those five W's and H, that's the answer to the what do I talk about question. Next, people say, there's so many platforms on social media. Which ones should I use? This is a really good question. So my colleague, Donna, works with a couple of personal trainers. She trains with a couple of personal trainers in Pembroke Pines. That's not Donna, those are not her trainers. Now those trainers do not have a website. If you look for them on Facebook, you will not find them. Their email list has a total of zero emails. They do all their marketing and get all their clients using, anybody got a guess? Snapchat. 100%. Now this is not me telling you that you have to be on Snapchat, it's to illustrate the point. What platform should you use? Use the ones that you like and the ones that you will use. You don't need to be an octopus using Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Snapchat, Periscope, all at the same time if you don't want to. If you're not comfortable using those platforms, you don't have to be using them. So just because one of your competitors is using it doesn't mean you have to use it. If you're good at the one that you use or the two or the 10 that you use, keep using those. You don't have to do everything at the same time. You don't want to force your social media. Because people can tell when it's forced that you're just doing it to try to get someone else to buy into your business, and they're not going to engage with what you're doing. Now the third thing, People say, well, there's so much information on social media, so many different things I can do, it's so easy to get into and out, to of, every, out of every platform. Where do I begin? So who in this room is having a challenge with what type of content they should start with on social media? Raise your hand. All right, what industry are you in? Hospitality. Hospitality, what's your challenge specifically? Um, right now we're at, we're Ocean Park Restaurant, we're under uh, renovations, Ocean Street 3, 4. Um, so the typical content that I'm Okay, did everybody hear that question? Okay. So first of all, you want to start with who you are. Because when you talk about a restaurant, there are a thousand different restaurant choices in South Florida. So why should I come to your restaurant? What is it that your restaurant's going to offer me that I'm not going to get anywhere else? Now, of course you've had great food, but any restaurant can say that. So I want you to tell me how am I going to feel when I walk out of that restaurant that I didn't feel when I walked in. Because people can go anywhere to get food, but someone will travel far and wide to get a feeling. So when you explain to people that you're going to feel differently, Whatever your business is, I'm going to feel differently after I get this massage, after I buy these sneakers, after I eat this meal, after I've had this fantastic service. People will go far and wide to get a feeling. The second thing is you're going under, you're under construction. People want to know that. People want to know what's happening in the business. They don't. Anyone can tell when a business is too perfect, quote unquote. Everything seems to be good. Everybody seems to be perfect there. They're all smiling faces. Of course, you want to be happy and give good customer service. But if you're going under construction, people want to know that. Here's our construction. Here's what we're working on. Here's our main contractor giving us a, take a picture of him, post it on Instagram, and put a two-paragraph story of him explaining what it is he's doing construction-wise, what part is this that he's working on that you're, taking, that you're looking at in the picture, why he's the guy that you chose. Have your owner come on, on Facebook, maybe make a two-minute video. This is why we did renovations. 
this is what we're working on, and this is how our business is going to be better at the end of construction than it was from the beginning of construction. Talk to a couple of your employees, had them post on maybe Snapchat. This is what's going on during the construction. This is how my job has been different. This is how it's been a challenge. This is how it's been better. And this is how everything's going to be better after construction is done. Does that make sense? Or who else has one? Y'all scared of me? What? <laughs> yes. So our business is a uh, restoration business, emergency services. Okay. So they don't need to say it's not like a product. They don't need us right now. And they might not need it for the their whole lives. Okay. So I have to brand it so that if they take basically trouble fire, water, something like that, that they would call us. Okay. So we have kind of that sort of, you can do those phone posts so that you can, uh, people see your name on the paper. I'm trying to figure out how we can do it more productive to kind of get that model up. Okay, so he's in the restoration business, emergency services. He wants to know how can, how can you establish a brand name so that if and when people need you, they, you're the one that they go to. Okay, so what you're gonna do in an industry like that is what we call educational-based marketing. So first thing you wanna do is share with people what it is your business does. Because if I heard that term, restoration business is emergency service, I don't know what that is. So the first thing you're gonna do is get on your blog, or get on your YouTube, or get on LinkedIn, or get on Twitter, and you're gonna explain what it is that business is. What is it that we do? Why is it you will call me? So if this happens, you call me. That's a blog post. You can take that same blog for your purposes to your website, post it on LinkedIn, post it on Facebook. Then get on YouTube, make a video, verbalizing everything that you wrote. So you can repurpose the same content from each platform. And then you can tweet it out in little bite-sized pieces. Also, with that type of industry, this type of industry that you only call on in certain situations, when somebody has an emergency, usually they're, they might be panicking. So they just want to find the first thing that they can think of. So you want to be top of mind to those people. So you want to educate. Take someone who you have helped already, because you have some satisfied clients, right? Go to one of your satisfied clients. Have them make a two-minute YouTube video. You pre-read the questions for them, what they're going to answer. Have a video of them saying, this is what happened to me, this is how they helped me, and this is how life was better after. Again, they are going after that feeling. Because when people feel that feeling, that's what they're going to come to your business for. And when you're in front of them every day, of course, you can't keep saying, hey, an emergency might happen, your house might burn down, you might get in a car accident. You don't want to keep putting that in front of people. But again, you educate them. If this happens, I'm the person to call. Look at this guy, Mike. This happened to him. He called us. This is what we did for him. And this is how life is better afterwards. And it's the same thing in your post when you write. You write about why would someone need that type of service? Why did you go into that business? What got you involved in that business? What did you get out of that business? This is another thing that you can write about. And you also can put this in video because today, a lot of people don't read. They like to watch videos. So if you put something in writing, you can still write, because I love to write too, but I take everything that I write and I put it into a video content. I just put it into a video platform. So I make a YouTube video or a Facebook video or an Instagram or Snapchat so that people can see it at the same time. So you still have your readers, but you also got a lot of lazy people just want to watch video. Does that help? Yeah. Uh, anyone else? <clears throat> take one more, yes. Uh, how do you get people to retweet or share the content that you put on social media? Here's the thing. You don't get people to do it. They only do it when they want to. How do, you, how do people want to? You have to share something that's valuable to them. So people only retweet or share something that they feel is valuable. This means you might make them laugh, might make them angry, you might make them cry, you might give somebody something to think about, you might put out a piece of information that somebody thinks other people need to hear. So that's how you get that. So basically you take what it is that you're doing uniquely in your business and you share that. And when people see that and say, oh, you know what, there's useful information, I think my followers will want to know that. And again, this is a subconscious conversation that happens in a split second. Then they're going to retweet it. Then they're going to share it. But you want to make it something that people are going to pay attention to. So you can use photos as far as you're talking about Twitter and Facebook. Use photos in your posts. Don't use too many hashtags. You don't want it to be too spammy. You want it to look like it's a real person talking. And if I look down somebody's Twitter timeline, all I see is link, 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 hashtag, hashtag, hashtag. I know that's a business. I know that they're auto-tweeting and I'm not paying any attention to it because I know it's not a real person behind it. I want to see people talking, people engaging, talking to other people, and just saying things. Not just always giving me a link to your website, not telling me to go sign up for your email list, not putting 10 hashtags and everything to get more people to follow you. Just talk. Be a normal person. People like to follow people. People buy from people, they don't buy from businesses. So you have to make humanize what it is you know. Any more, one more. Yes. How do you utilize social media to your oh, efficiently when your client base or corporation or folks act 
What kind of business you A law firm. So you're saying, how do you use a lot, utilize it efficiently? Yeah. Let's so, say, let's say my target client is Office Depot or State Farm, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in your law firm, what area of law do you practice? Insurance defense. Insurance defense. Okay, so what you're going to talk about, first of all, is what is insurance defense? I don't even know what that means. So the first thing is you're going to talk about what insurance defense is. What is happening in your, what would be happening in my life in which I would even call an insurance defense attorney? So that way, everybody can eventually become a person who's paying attention to what you're writing. Because if you're only talking about state farm insurance defense, I'm not paying attention. But if you say that this is happening to you, this is when you would call an insurance defense attorney. Here's someone who this happened, they called us. This is what we did, and this is how things got better afterwards. Here's a client that we worked with. This is their situation. This is how we helped, and this is why they needed to get involved with us. If you need insurance defense, there might be people out there, would you agree, there are people out there right now, probably 